Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos and today we're going to talk about Lumbee Heritage here in East Baltimore. But I have to start by saying thank you to a woman named Ashley Minner. Um, Ashley over the last many years has done an incredible amount of research uh, documenting and sharing Lumbee history um, and I am sorry that she is not able to join us on the video today but uh, we're going to talk about her at the end in a second. Um, also have to say that today's video, although we're not hitting it exactly spot on. Um, we wanted to do it today because it is close to the birthday of a woman named Elizabeth Locklear, who is one of the founders of the Baltimore American Indian Center, which is the building behind me, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. Um, all right, so let's first, before we jump into uh, East Baltimore, let's talk a little bit about the Lumbee. Um, they trace their roots and their heritage back to North Carolina, um, sort of the southwestern part of North Carolina. If you know where Fayetteville is, uh, it's the area south of there. Um, they came together most likely uh, uh, centuries ago uh, from some folks who were uh, breaking away from the Sioux and the Algonquin and some other tribes. Um, the first recorded history, written history we have of them is from 1745, I believe that's the date. Um, a white settler was documenting, making a map uh, of the uh, area around the Lumber River. And I will be willing to bet today there, there still is a Lumber River uh, down there. Uh, but I would be willing to bet if we were down there and we were a member of the Lumbee uh, tribe, we would call it the Lumbee River. Um, there have been Lumbee folks uh, migrating north here to Baltimore for over 100 years. Uh, but the, uh, the big migration, a big migration, took place after World War II in the early 1950s. Thousands of Lumbee were heading north to Baltimore, to other cities like Philadelphia and even Detroit. Um, here in Baltimore, we were lucky uh, that thousands of them uh, uh, stayed here. Um, and by the late 1950s, it's estimated that the population of Lumbee in Baltimore was between 2,000 and 7,000 people. And in fact, in some blocks here in East Baltimore, and where Baltimore, uh, I'm sorry, Broadway and say Pratt Street, uh, on some blocks around here, there were as many as uh, 400 Lumbee uh, on a single block. So really a high uh, density here. Um, when, they, uh, when they came here in the 50s, they took jobs as carpenters and painters, other construction trades uh, in the garment industry. Uh, they had, uh, the Lumbee communities in, in North Carolina um, had been largely agricultural, so they took jobs like other uh, agricultural folks moving to cities in the 50s and 60s. Um, but they also, one of the things they did early on, which uh, others had done, is start a church. Now let's talk about that for a second. It's just a block uh, away from me, also on South Broadway. It's the South Broadway Baptist Church. And uh, folks uh, had joined together in the 1950s, pretty early on, uh, and formed a congregation. They started meeting in people's houses. Then they rented spaces from other buildings, other churches. And by 1978, they had been able to purchase the building that they're, uh, that they're in today still. Interestingly, uh, one of the folks who helped them get that building is uh, Mayor William Donald Schaefer. He had, a, he had attended a homecoming event. The church had held annual homecoming events uh, for many years. These were big celebrations, lots of food, lots of dancing, cultural events. And at the end of the event, Schaefer, in sort of Schaefer fashion, uh, approached the church leaders and said, what do you need? What can I do to help? And they fired back. They said, well, we've been trying to buy this building. We're too large for the church that we're in now and would like to buy this bigger building. And uh, to his credit, uh, Schaefer came through. Uh, the, the congregation was able to buy the building with, a, with the help of a $90,000 loan from Baltimore City, which they paid back within five years and are uh, happily still going strong uh, uh, there today. So the building also plays a role in another uh, important sort of point in Lumbee heritage, and that's the founding of what becomes the Baltimore American Indian Center behind me. Um, although it's here today, it got its start in the 1960s, uh, and it's uh, in people's homes, and its first real location was in that church building, um, which at that point was uh, owned by the Southeast Community Organization um, that uh, leased out space to various community groups, um, including the new center at the time. There were a lot of folks who came together for the center, uh, people of Lumbee heritage, uh, but also, let me make sure I get the names right, uh, people of other heritage, including the, the co 
Kohari um, and the Hilawa Sapani uh, uh, folks, um, as well as Quakers who uh, helped them with uh, fundraising as well. Um, some of the, th or, I'm sorry, three of maybe the most uh, biggest movers and shakers uh, were a gentleman named Herbert Locklear, uh, a, a woman named Rosie Hunt, uh, and then of course Elizabeth Locklear, um, uh, whose birthday we're celebrating. I will have to say, in going through some of the, uh, the historic materials uh, from uh, this era, there are a lot of Locklears in East Baltimore at this time, uh, uh, really an extraordinary amount and made a, a pretty big impact. Um, so let me actually read a, uh, a short quote from Herbert Locklear, who I think might have been the center's director, um, about, upon its moving in in 1970 to the church building. He said, the center evolved out of an identified need for a place where Indian culture, Indian life, history, and craft could be shared with one another and with other interested people in the community. The center also evolved from identified need to preserve, protect, and nourish Indian history and culture with an emphasis upon establishing and maintaining a proper image of the American Indian in the interest of all peoples concerned. Um, there is a lot packed into that two-sentence uh, quote. The one thing I wa uh, want to just point out is that from the very beginning, the center um, was uh, uh, welcoming and encouraging of people of all heritages uh, to come and participate. Uh, uh, the only criteria being uh, an interest and a fondness for American Indian heritage. Um, so they got their start in 1970 in the building, uh, but uh, by 1972 they had purchased the building behind me. And it dates, uh, the church building dates from 1848. It was uh, first a mariner's church. This building is even older. It dates to 1843. Um, and as a total aside, I have to say uh, the Lumbee have been fantastic in buying uh, historic buildings and fixing them up. So 1843 is when this building was built for a sea captain. Um, captain Hug, I believe, was his name. Um, captains and then were sort of the top of the pecking order in the port city of uh, Fells Point. And, uh, and this was a fine house with a really enviable address. Um, over the years, the building had been used as a dentist's office, a boarding house, other residences. By the 1920s, a Catholic charity group had uh, purchased it and was using it as a daycare center for kids whose uh, parents were working, especially uh, mothers who were working. Um, but uh, by 1972, uh, the center had purchased the building and it quickly became a hub of Indian culture here in East Baltimore. There was a restaurant there and a, a workforce training program to give people uh, sort of job skills in the restaurant industry. Um, they had loads of cultural events um, and they provided health care as well, a much needed thing uh, in the 1970s in East Baltimore. Um, by, 19, by the 1990s, however, some of their funding had uh, dried up. They were still offering programs, but they had kind of mothballed the building and they were offering programs out of the Patterson Park Recreation Center. Uh, but they weren't down for long. By the late 90s and early 2000s, um, they were raising money and in fact raised enough money to build a multi-purpose center in the backyard of the house. Um, the backyard is surprisingly big. The center is big enough that it can uh, house a basketball court. You can play basketball back there, um, as well as host events for uh, many, many people. Um, they also just uh, uh, relatively more recently, say five or so years ago, raised enough money to convert the first floor of this 1843 building um, into a museum, a heritage museum. So I'm going to wrap up. Uh, let me actually wrap up with a, a quote from Elizabeth Locklear, whose birthday we're, uh, we're honoring. Um, she, upon moving to Baltimore in the 1960s, said, when I came here, there was no such thing as an Indian in Baltimore. You were either black or white. And that was true not just colloquially, but even the U.S. Census. If you were back here in the 1960s and you were filling out your census form, there were only two boxes to check for race, black or white. So obviously, Miss Locklear um, and her kin were at a loss for what to do. Um, so let me read one more quote from her. Um, uh, upon founding the center, she said she was driven uh, in part because, quote, because there was nothing here our children could relate to as Indians. And although Mrs. Locklear passed away, I believe, two years ago, um, she has got loads of friends and family here in Baltimore and in uh, North Carolina. Uh, and I hope that they uh, will join in celebrating um, her 
your efforts uh, that have made a profound impact um, uh, with the American Indian community and the Lumbee community um, here in Baltimore. Um, all right, final word before I uh, uh, say thanks is that if you're interested, um, Ashley Minner w does walking tours when we can, when it's not COVID. The museum's open when it's not COVID, uh, but she leads walking tours. But she's also kindly put her walking material material up on, uh, up on the web. So you can print out a map and you can print out each of the stops with information about each one and do the walking tour yourself. And if you, if you go up there and do that and you come on out here to South Broadway, you very, mel, very well may find me walking around by myself, socially distanced, um, with that material in my hand, learning a little bit more. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.